Today we are going to talk about the macromolecules of the cell, focusing on the role of proteins, particularly its role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. The case described in the Seaman Connections actually explains the role of aggregated proteins in the development of Alzheimer's. So read through the case that is shown here on screen together with me. Mrs. Peterson got a new bracelet today. On the front, there is an important medical information. And the inscription on the back has her daughter's phone number should someone need to call her. Mrs. Peterson is not sure if she likes the bracelet or why she even has it. She sometimes gets lost on her way to the store, forgets why she walked into a room, and can't recognize people she has known for years. For the next 5 to 10 years, her memory will continue to decline. She is already in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Now, in the next few slides, you will see how proteins, particularly aggregated proteins, results to the development of Alzheimer's disease. And those familiar with Alzheimer's disease would know what you'd call as the Alzheimer's patient effects. This is the devastating effect that Alzheimer's have not only on the patients but also to their caregivers. The Alzheimer's patient effects would have something to do with the suffering on the emotional side, emotional strain of both patients and caregivers. The impact of Alzheimer's is far-reaching. We don't have any data for the Philippine setting, but from the book reference that you're using right now, it says that 1 in 10 Americans over the age of 65 has the disease. And it is no respecter of persons. In other words, it doesn't choose whether you're a past president, whether you're an actor, whether you're an athlete, or whether you're you're an academician or whatever any individual can actually succumb to the disease and take note one out of 10 americans would have it by the age of 65 or so and within the next 40 years they actually made an estimate that alzheimer's would result to around 1.2 trillion in annual payoffs or payouts rather to the healthcare and the health related services in the united states alone Imagine they would be spending 1.2 trillion dollars. That's in dollars. We don't have that kind of money. So just imagine how financially this would really drain the family and even the country if we are to fund this particular disease. The symptoms of Alzheimer's are caused by the degeneration of brain cells due to excessive association of proteins that are found both outside and within the brain cells. Alzheimer's patients exhibit two kinds of structural abnormalities. The first one is known as amyloid plaques. as you can see in this particular slide here. Amyloid plaques are found both within and outside the brain cells. These structures contain fibrils made of protein fragments around 40 to 42 amino acid long. These are what you'd call as amyloid beta peptide or the AB fibrils. How exactly are these fragments formed? is formed because of the presence of an enzyme that breaks down an amyloid precursor protein otherwise known as APP. Once broken down, it will form the 40 to 42 amino acid long fragment known as the AB fibrils. So what's so special about this AB fibrils? These are actually not soluble. And because they are insoluble in the extracellular environment, these AB fibrils will accumulate, and when they accumulate, it will lead to the formation of what is known as the amyloid plaques. The amyloid plaques will now accumulate or build up in the synapses between the brain cells, 
and when it does so then the brain cell will no longer be able to transmit nerve impulses and so there would be associated memory loss and sometimes changes in behavior of alzheimer's patients There are several possible causes of amyloid plaque formation in Alzheimer's. The first would be an inherited mutation. For example, there is a mutation in the APP gene. The second would be, what if the genes that encode the enzymes responsible for cleaving APP into AB would also undergo mutation? And when it does so, what if the said mutation will favor the formation of AB fibrils. Number two. Number two is not really a mutation, but merely the presence of a different form of protein. For example, apolipoprotein E, otherwise known as ApoE, is actually... Um, Apolipoprotein, sorry for that, is actually a protein that is essential for the transport of cholesterol in cells. But there is a variation to the apolipoprotein E. And this variant of apolipoprotein will favor the formation of amyloid plaques. And if that variant is present, then amyloid plaque will be formed. Another one would be repetitive mild and major brain injuries. This is associated to athletes like say boxers or footballers for example who get brain injuries as a result of their sports. Another structural form of Alzheimer's is the amyloid accumulation. Amyloid accumulation leads to the second major type of alterations in the brain tissues of Alzheimer's patients. These are actually known as the neurofibrillary tangles. So what are these neurofibrillary tangles? These are actually abnormal structures that are largely composed of polymerized form of a protein called the tau protein. So the tau protein is abundant in the central nervous system. And normally, it is essential to stabilize the microtubules, which is a key element that is necessary, for example, during cell division and maintenance of the shape of the cell. However, if the tau proteins become entangled because it is excessively phosphorylated, it will result to the formation of neurofibrillary tangles. And these neurofibrillary tangles will somehow lead to progressive cell death in the brain. And subsequently, there will be also memory loss, very much similar to the formation of the amyloid plaque. In this particular slide, you will see the neurofibrillary tangles, sorry, in yellow here. So this is a figure showing the brain scan of an individual with normal mild cognitive impairment and already the full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Notice that in mild cognitive impairment, it, the patient is still actually capable of doing cognitive functions because only mild impairment occurred. They can still recognize, but sometimes they would forget something, but they are still functioning individuals. Now, notice that some of the brain cells are already destroyed here because of probably either of the two structural forms of Alzheimer's. On the other hand, take a look at this. This time, a large portion of the brain has been destroyed or has been damaged, resulting now to the Alzheimer's disease. So how exactly can we treat Alzheimer's? Well, there are several possibilities in treating Alzheimer's, and that would include probably inhibiting or eliminating the formation of the AB at a number of different steps in the process in order to treat Alzheimer's. First possibility, 
What if there is an enzyme inhibitor that will block the cleavage of the AB from its precursor a APP? Therefore, if the enzyme cannot cleave the APP protein, then there will be no AB fibrils formed and no amyloid plaques formed. Second possibility. Small molecules that is capable of disrupting amyloid plaques or preventing their formation. Number three, using molecular biology techniques, RNAi will, will be used. And RNAi is actually a technology whereby you destroy the messenger RNA that is responsible for the formation eventually of gene products that will lead to the formation of plaques. So the RNA, therefore, RNAi, reduces the translation of the proteins that will lead to plaque formation. Another option would be AB vaccine. That is a vaccine that will stimulate the immune system to clean up the amyloid plaques or a vaccine that will prevent the formation of the amyloid plaques itself. But actually, there are already such vaccines existing that appear to be capable of protecting the mice from Alzheimer-like symptoms. So there is therefore hope that probably we could develop a similar vaccine that can be used for humans. This ends our discussion on the role of proteins in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for watching.